the gain, and of course this is Shackleton. I don't know if you can hear him purring. He's actually purring quite, quite loudly. I think last time I had him up here, I gave him some food, so he kind of expects that, but I didn't. I don't have any at the moment, so he'll probably get annoyed in a minute. So in the previous video, I talked about the Arctic heat emergency, how it's going global, and and how that's bad news, and how um, it's likely the way that uh, it will, the most severe consequence for humanity in the near term will be the disruption to our global food supply. So I had an interview on Radio EcoShock, um, which uh, Alex Smith um, uh, recorded and uh, released. And uh, you know, it's uh, you can just Google it to find the link. It's called "The Arctic Heat Emergency Goes Global," and that's bad news. Radio EcoShock posted on December 9th, twenty twenty. So please, uh, please check that out. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to go into some more details of some details on what the Arctic Report Card 2020 concludes, the a a ARC 2020. Okay, so um, here, here's my, um, I've both put it on uh, Facebook, uh, on my Facebook page and Facebook group and also on Twitter, um, both Alex's interview and um, the videos that I'm doing on the Arctic Report Card when they're completed. So basically, the 2020 Arctic Report Card, it depicts a region lurching into a new, unfamiliar state. Global warming has profoundly transformed the Arctic in just 15 years, the report warns. So this 2020 was the Arctic's second warmest year on record, and this is the difference from the average temperature, uh, 4.4 degrees Celsius, um, up to, or 8 degrees Fahrenheit. So look at the huge warming here over these regions. And of course, this warming over this region really massacred the Arctic sea ice early in the, in the um, melt season. So the Arctic as we once knew it was an inhospitable, barely accessible and ice bound place, but that's gone. We don't have that anymore. Climate change has transformed it into a region that can heat up to 100 degrees, that's Fahrenheit, um, in the Arctic summer. It's beset by ferocious wildfires in the taiga, the boreal forest, and it's covered in permafrost that's no longer permanent. So you gotta take the perma out of the permafrost, so, so call it perma melt, for example, or call it uh, um, melting frost, or, or non-permafrost, or, or temporary frost, I don't know. The sea ice cover that's long defined the far north is fast disappearing. Okay, so this report card that was just released in the last week, um, it's uh, led by NOAA, the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, 133 scientists 15, from 15 countries, and they're pointing just to trends that with each passing year have grown more extreme and have far reaching implications for people living far outside the region, including in the lower 48 states. Remember my quote, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The Arctic as a whole is warming at nearly three times the rate of the rest of the world. Now remember for years and years, every report on the Arctic warming, the Arctic temperature amplification said two times. Well, now they're saying three times. I mean, I said three to five times for many years, in fact, the high Arctic um, is eight to nine to 10 times faster than the rest of the planet. So this is because of feedback loops between the snow, ice, and land cover. This rapid warming is largely the result of increased emissions of greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas. The Arctic is quickly losing its ice, and as it loses its ice, it loses its soul. It's becoming a warm place. Um, in terms of a report card, the Arctic has been failing for a long time and the blame lies with us. Okay, this year the biggest Arctic climate extremes were the persistent, dramatically warmer than average conditions in the Siberian Arctic. This had a domino effect that led to record low sea ice 
in the adjacent Kara and Laptev seas, a wildfire season that defied historical norms, melting permafrost, and changes in wildlife. The story is unambiguous. The transformation of the Arctic to a warmer, less frozen, and biologically changed region is well underway. Okay, so these report cards have been going since 2016. This is the 15th report card. Okay, um, and you know, right when the first report came out, near then came 2007, the, Sar Ar the September sea ice extent didn't just drop to a new record low, it blew away the old record. So in many ways, 2007 was the beginning of the new Arctic. And since 2007, it's been one piece of bad news after another in the Arctic. In 2020, the Arctic saw its second lowest sea ice extent. At the end of the melt season, the temperature over the region was four degrees Fahrenheit or 2.2 degrees Celsius, warmer than the 1981 to 2010 average, okay? The year was the second hottest on record for the Arctic since at least 1900. Nine of the past 10 years were at least one degree Celsius above the, the average. Okay, so this is the trend of extreme summer warmth in the Arctic seas. So you can see the, the red areas here where there's been tremendous warmth. This is where the temperature trend is over from 1982 to 2020, the temperature trend in degrees Celsius per year. So 0 0.1 degrees Celsius per year, okay, um, is, is the temperature trend of warming in those, those regions here. Okay, um, in Siberia, new spikes in wildfire ver ver ferocity, changes in fire locations, and extension of the duration of the fire season was seen this year. There's a lot of variability from year to year, but the trends are very, very clear. Increasing trends in air temperature and fuel availability over the 41-year record suggests that conditions are becoming more favorable in the Arctic for fire growth. More intense burning, more fire growth episodes, greater consumption of fuels. There's also these uh, fires which are burning deep into the permafrost, into the soils rather, the, the peat and they smolder all winter and then they reignite uh, so they don't go out and they, they uh, reignite into flaming fires in the spring. The extreme wildfires in Russia's Saka Republic show what can happen when an extremely warm spring and summer air temperatures melt snow far earlier than is typical. Okay, so the snow cover has set record lows um, in, um, in, in uh, May and June mostly in June, and that dries out vegetation or fuels, and it sets up the situation for wildfires. We're also getting a lot more thunderstorms traveling farther north with the warming, and the lightning from these storms can, can, can trigger fires. So these, the Arctic is moving from a fire-resistant to a fire-prone region. Um, global attention on the warmth in Eurasia came when the town of Verkhoyansk, about 3,000 miles east of Moscow, it reached 100.4 degrees or 38 Celsius on June 20th in 2020. That's a record high temperature for the Arctic since 1885, since measurements began. So where is this place? I go to Google Earth and I put in this name here and then I just search for it. Enter. Here, here's where we are. Okay. This is the town here, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll go out here and you can see how close it is up to the, the Arctic. It's at 66, uh, it's at 67 degrees north uh, latitude. Okay, um, so you know, we're, we're basically, the, the, uh, so the Arctic boreal forests and tundra are going through the most rapid climate change on Earth at the moment. The Siberian fires are an example of an Arctic climate change trend that was not entirely unexpected, but it's happened much faster than expected. Much faster than expected, that's the story of, of climate change. Okay, so the fire season in the Russian Arctic for 2020, it started early 
It ended late. It released an enormous amount of greenhouse gases through biomass burning, and it thawed some of the world's most sensitive permafrost underneath the heat of the fires. Okay, and these are the fire fuels are becoming increasingly flammable in northern high latitudes. So, so this is showing something called the flammability buildup index. The higher the number, the more likely a fire can occur there. This is in Canada, and this is on the 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 Russian side. The your okay. So all of these regions in brown are much higher flammability building up. Um, the study also looked at, uh, you know, walruses and polar bears and, uh, you know, the wh a whale species, which is the only truly Arctic baleen whale, and it's a staple of indigenous people's diets, is becoming more abundant thanks to increases in the amount of open water. And the, the open water allows more sunlight to be absorbed by the sea, so there's increases in, in um, phytoplankton at the base of the food chain that constitute the whale's diet. Okay, so baleen whales, they, they feed on the plankton. They've got the gill um, filters, which, which filter, um, that's their diet. Huge creatures eating the smallest uh, um, krill and um, plankton at the base of the food chain. Um, okay, um, and so anyway, let's look at the details of this. Okay, so... This is the Arctic report card. If you just Google 2020 Arctic report card, you can get their website with some of the highlights. Um, and uh, you can get more details and more information. And if you go down here, you can find the report card full PDF, which is what I'll talk about in a minute. But let's just talk about some of the, the highlights. So. The average annual land surface air temperature north of 60 degrees for October 2019 to September 2020. It's the second highest on record since at least 1900. Record warm temperature. The, the Eurasian Arctic side, extremely warm. I mean, Europe is setting some of the most incredible heat records. That's extending right up into the Arctic, right up into the Arctic Ocean. and and keeping the ice, you know, melting the ice earlier, making sure that the snow cover is gone very early and setting up the Arctic for tremendous uh, melting um, in the spring and most of the summer. During July and August 2020, the regional ocean, the ocean primary productivity, so this is a phytoplankton at the base of the food chain, in the Laptev Sea was two times higher for July and six times higher for August compared to their monthly averages. It's because the sea ice disappeared in both the um, uh, Laptev Sea, um, in, in the Laptev Sea. So therefore in July and August, because it was open water, the light could just go in, stimulating the, the, the phytoplankton blooms. The exceptional warm spring t air temperatures across Siberia resulted in a record low June snow cover extent across the Eurasian Arctic, record low as observed in the past 54 years. Um, and I'll show you this data. Um, the Greenland ice sheet from September 2019 to August 2020, the Greenland ice sheet experienced higher ice loss than the average, but it was lower the, in 2018-2019, it set a record. So it's cut back a little bit from that. Um, there's a lot more instrumentation, a lot more uh, sophistication in the Arctic Observing Network, giving us much better data. The sea ice loss in the spring 2020 was very early in the Siberian Sea and Laptev Sea, setting new record lows. Um, and then towards the end of the summer, it slowed down, as I've mentioned in previous videos, but it set the uh, record, it set the, uh, it was second behind 2012, still has the record. The bowhead whales, um, the population has, is, has increased significantly because of the, uh, better, the, the higher primary productivity. The extreme wildfires co co coincided with unparalleled warm air temperatures and record snow loss. Outside of Greenland, the glaciers and ice sheets continued to be significantly melted. There was an expedition called the Mosaic, multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate, which drifted throughout the Arctic. Um, sea surface temperatures, one to three degrees warmer, um, huge coastal permafrost erosion, tundra greening, 
and so on. So I'll continue. I'm going to talk about this report now in, in great detail. Thanks for listening.